Thank you to the patrons for supporting the channel. Welcome back. Today we're continuing our Five Nights at Freddy's retrospective series. Today, FNAF World. This game is the most different out of any Five Nights at Freddy's game to date. It doesn't necessarily mean it's better, but it definitely changed things the most. But before we get into it, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Surfshark VPN. That's right, baby, we're sponsored. Now, while FNAF World may be a surprisingly unscary game, you know what is scary? people stealing your data. See, most internet users aren't even aware of the amount of surveillance, limitation, and data mining done with their personal information on a daily basis. Surfshark VPN can get rid of all these problems for you with an easy to use, one for all solution. Surfshark turns you into an anonymous and hard to track online user and makes the internet a safer and more enjoyable place for you. With a click of a button, you can forget about data mining and intrusive advertisement. Do you know what geoblocking is? Netflix or Disney Plus, for example, have different movies for each country. Well, you don't have to worry about being blocked from your favorite shows or movies anymore because Surfshark gives you all the access you need. Just connect to the service and refresh the page. Access granted. I use Surfshark and it's made browsing the internet feel a whole lot safer than before. Now I only have to worry about the horrors of video games and not the internet. Use promo code SAGAN to get 83% off plus 3 extra months for free. Surfshark offers a 30 day money back guarantee so there's no risk. Surf on your own set of rules. The link is in the description. So without further ado, let's get into it. After FNAF 4, the classic thank you image was uploaded on Scott's site. Basically, all of the characters waving and saying thank you. It seemed like it was a real send-off to the game. However, people then started noticing something changing. Certain characters' designs looking slightly different, more cartoony. And this culminated in the reveal of the name, FNAF World. With a few interruptions for FNAF 4's Game Theory stream and some Halloween update stuff, we had revealed all of the new designs for this FNAF World project. And then, of course, the trailer. Creepy. Eerie heads zooming in with ominous text and music, and then... A cartoon turn-based RPG. Uh, okay then. And the mangle using a ping-pong paddle for some reason. I don't remember a lot of theories of substance surrounding these reveals besides it possibly just being another prank game. It was just so odd it didn't really make a lot of sense. So I guess we can move on because January 21st, 2016, FNAF World was released. Now you might think we'd move right on to gameplay, but things were a little complicated and controversial with the release of FNAF World. Unlike what was shown in the trailer, the overworld was just simple 8-bit art. The game had a variety of other issues, being generally unstable and unfinished. It originally cost $10, which was more than any other FNAF game. So people were disappointed. But what Scott did next I think shows that he was a developer of integrity. He offered refunds to everyone who had bought it, removed it from Steam, and later, in February of 2016, he released an updated, finished version on Game Jolt this time with the 3D overworld and many of the issues fixed. And so that's the version we're going to be talking about. Let's go. Now, it would be stupid to compare this gameplay to the gameplay of any other FNAF game. It's a turn-based RPG. But also, I don't really know a lot about RPGs either, so I'm just gonna call it like I see it. I think it'd be most useful to break it down into a few sections. The basics, characters, chips and bites, and areas. The basics are pretty normal. You can play the game on normal or hard, and with or without a fixed party. As Freddy, you wander the overworld, advancing the story. Randomly, like in Pokemon Grass, you will have encounters with enemies in groups or by themselves. These move you to a separate battle screen where you fight. Interestingly, this isn't a normal turn-based game. The characters in your party work on a sort of timed order which they can attack, but so do your enemies. So instead of specific turns, you can time certain attacks or moves to defend against the enemies. Certain areas will also have boss encounters, which are just like regular battles, but harder and you can see their health. You can use money you get from chests around the overworld, beating enemies, or Dee Dee's fishing game to buy helpful things like armor, bites, and chips. If you do Fixed Party, you are stuck with only a few that you select at the beginning of your two parties, but you start with more unlocked. In Adventure Mode, you start with the classic FNAF 1 characters in one party, and then the FNAF 2 characters in your second party. As you play, certain encounters will lead you to a new challenger. It will be a random character from the games that will be added to your roster if you beat it. Obviously, the harder to beat and the higher level, the better the moveset is. Each character has an arsenal of three attacks or moves. 
Some are more heal centered, some are more support or debuff centered, some are more damage or just straight up random chance based. This is where the game becomes most interesting. Now, the depth of customization isn't as much as other RPGs, but finding exactly how you want to balance with what characters in each party and using your first and second party uniquely is where the interesting and fun part of the game happens. Oh, also between loading screens you get little character flavor text. With the introduction of a now fan favorite, Lulbit sells things called Bites. These are miniature characters that can't die but also don't count as a part of your health. They have a range of different abilities, from healing to damage dealing to bosses to their own small attacks. There are usually three levels of each type and you can add up to four active at a time. Chips are similar in a lot of ways. You find them in various large chests in the overworld. You equip them to have certain passive effects and can only have four at a time. These effects range from damage dealing, comets falling, to giving your team a speed boost, to giving you more luck. This is again where things become interesting. You know, depending on what you're actually trying to do, find characters, defeat a boss, or just level up, you're going to use different chips and bites, and deciding which ones to use because you only have a few slots becomes really interesting and a fun balancing act. Throughout the game there are different biomes and areas. The bosses and enemies change based on the biome as you progress. Snowy characters, rocky cave creatures, weird funhouse guys. Enemies in these areas usually get harder as you progress, and the bosses are usually pretty unique. Then there's the flip side, an obvious reference to Phone Guy's line, see you on the flip side from FNAF 1. These are glitched areas deep inside the game you enter by walking into flickering objects in the overworld. They take you to more and more simplified versions of the overworld, which you can use to get around blocked areas. However, as Fredbear warns, don't go too deep. But what makes it scary? Absolutely nothing. Obviously, it's not supposed to look scary. All the characters are redesigned to look cute. Although, I will say, certain times, just like with Nightmare Balloon Boy, it can't be made cute, and although some of the designs are really great, like the nightmares, sometimes in an attempt to make them look cute, they look scarier than they did in the original game. Here's another thing about the visuals. They are insane. Later on in the game, it's just a million particle effects and screen shake. I personally really like the chaos, it makes it feel like shit is going down, but to others it may seem more obnoxiously bright and distracting but to each their own. When it comes to enemies and bosses, a lot of them are legitimately well done. Brow Boy is a masterpiece. Some enemies are just retextures, but I suppose that was an attempt to create enemy types. Each biome's adherence to a specific style is legitimately impressive, and it makes the whole game feel cohesive. There's not much to say here like there is with the other games. The music is really great, each area has a unique backing track that sound good and are memorable, and all the boss battles and fights are high energy because of the really good fight music. The sound effects for each move are satisfying and really cool. Honestly, just the sound in general in FNAF World excels, but there's not anything special about the way it does it. Just good music and nice sound effects. Now there are so many endings and hidden secrets in this game, but let's just start with the basics. The game opens with a pair of pixel eyes staring in the darkness, and the lines, everything that happens out there has an effect here. Do you understand? This is a safe place. This is a sanctuary. But something has gone wrong, and now it can be seen here. Something went very wrong. That's why I'm here. But I won't let the same happen to you. I will put you back together. The rest of the game centers around you progressing with the advice of Fredbear. At certain points in the game, including right after this cutscene, Fredbear explains the main motivation. There is something horribly wrong with this animatronic world. Something has gone wrong on the flip side, and now strange creatures are wandering the world. From here, Fredbear sends you through new missions, beating bosses, and exploring new areas, finally ending in you disabling a security system and defeating the final boss. And then you get the... Wink ending. After defeating the boss, you enter a tent and get mocked by a voice, likely Scott Cawthon himself. Congratulations, you beat an imaginary monster in an imaginary game without taking any risks, without finding anything interesting. Literally mocking you for beating the game, which might seem odd, but with a game series that is so centered around secrets and hidden things, this was making it clear that there was something more. And there was. Playing through the game normally, but on hard mode, you defeat the final owl boss, security, and then move into the tent. This time, it leads you to the real final boss, Scott Cawthon himself. 
He gives you a monologue that seems almost like venting his frustrations with some aspects of being popular and having his games dissected so much. Although this seems to be another way to motivate the player to look deeper. Defeating him will give you THE END. Remember how I said Fredbear tells you not to go too deep in the flip side? Well, if you go four layers deep, you are teleported to Old Man Consequences Lake. A strange fisherman tells you that there's nothing else the player can do. After a bit, the game ends. By walking into the lake and glitching down, you begin falling endlessly in a void for two minutes. Finally, it cuts to an image. What exactly this is has been debated. An angel, Scott Cawthon and his kids. Either way, it will stay here until you shut the game off. Whichever character you have as a party leader will appear when talking to Fredbear. If you get Fredbear as your party leader and then talk to Fredbear, well, there's two of them. And as the game explains, there cannot be two Fredbears in the same time and space. So the game ends. Universe end. This end occurs when you enter the mysterious mine and move to a secret boss, Chipper. As in from Scott Cawthon's previous game before FNAF, Chipper and Sons Lumber Company. Essentially, Chipper is upset that his franchise was set aside for FNAF, and that's why he wants to destroy you. After you defeat him, he says you haven't seen the last of him, which to be fair is true. And finally, the clock ending. See, when talking to Fredbear at the end of his dialogue, you get a done button. But if you don't press it, after a while, Fredbear will glitch and begin breaking the fourth wall, leading you on a different objective, finding the clocks. When activating these secret dialogue options, clocks will begin appearing on the overworld. Each has a unique puzzle. The first has the player pushing Balloon Boy into a box. The second has the player activating four square buttons. Then pushing four cupcakes into boxes. Then properly setting a code, and then finally pushing Shadow Bonnie, known in this game as RWQFSFASXC, into a box. If you do all of this, the glitched Fredbear leads you to unlocking a portal, which leads you to the final cutscene. The eyes in the dark again. We are still your friends. Do you believe that? The pieces are in place for you. All you have to do is find them. Rest. The end. Alright, now before we get into theories and what the clock ending means and what all of this means, let's just talk about some of the more simpler easter eggs and hidden things. Oh, also, each ending has a unique trophy that, once you get it, will appear on your menu screen. First, you can enter the secret other area that's like a glitched version of the overworld, identified as just random letters. Here, there are much harder and glitchy enemies. You enter by walking into the seagull on a stump for a bit. There's also the pearl, which you get if you successfully catch the pearl in Dee Dee's fishing game five times. It doesn't count to your bite limit and heals you. Alright, with that out of the way... For most of this, I want to talk about the clock ending and what the community really thinks it means. But first, let's talk about some of the simpler stuff, general audience reception and things like that. Firstly, a lot of YouTubers known for playing Five Nights at Freddy's, like Markiplier for instance, decided not to play this game, and I can't blame them. The appeal of playing a Five Nights at Freddy's game, or a Let's Play of a Five Nights at Freddy's game, is different than the appeal of FNAF World. FNAF World is not scary, and it's also not super long, so there's not a lot of investment you can get out of it. It's more of a joke fun game, and so I guess I understand why the release was a bit rocky. On a more personal note, watching Razbowski play this game inserted the term pop it on the go into my general lexicon for two years. Okay, here we go. What does the clock ending mean? Well, the first and most obvious connection would be the Fredbear plush, and the line, you know, from Five Nights at Freddy's 4, I will put you back together. And there is a connection there, but first, let's talk about what each of the clock minigames mean. The main theory concluded by the community was that each of these clock minigames corresponded to a secret minigame in FNAF 3. Specifically, the hints on how you get to these minigames. The different things on the walls. BB double click. The arcade button code. The cupcakes. The code and shadow bonnie. Now think about the line, I will put you back together. That's FNAF 4, the bite victim. Now think about what happens at the end of the Happiest Day minigame. The children gather together to help free the soul of the Golden Freddy victim. I think you can see where I'm going here. Due to the meta nature of the game, it's assumed by the community that when Fredbear said, I will put you back together in Five Nights at Freddy's 4, he meant it in a very fourth wall breaking way. He literally goes to the player through FNAF World to put in place the hints that lets the Five Nights at Freddy's 3 player, not the night guard, the player who actually plays the games, be able to discover the happiest day ending, therefore putting him back together. 
It's weird how it's almost canon in a way, but super meta, like the Fredbear plush knows that he's in a game. Really weird. Now, I want to be clear here, it's not 100% confirmed that this is what all of this means, this just seemed to be the general community consensus when the game came out. And at least for update 1, that is the relevance to these games at large. So where does the game go on the tier list? Well, despite all the good things I've said about it, when we're rating it on a scale like the other games, it really doesn't hold up as well. At least for Update 1, even though I enjoyed it, I have to be honest and put it in C tier. The story for Update 1 was really not that important in the grand scheme of things, and the game had a bit of a rocky start when it was released, so I think C tier is a perfect place for it. It's just average. So, Scott Cawthon's website. Instead of teasing a new game, he teased a book, Five Nights at Freddy's The Untold Story. And I would like to talk about this at some point. Maybe when I'm done looking at all of the games, I can look at the first trilogy, the Silver Eyes trilogy. But for now, we're just going to talk about the game. So ignoring the book for now, the next game that was teased was FNAF World Update 2. So that's what we're going to be covering next. Update 2 of FNAF World. Hey, thanks for watching. I know this one was a bit short, but I think Update 1 and Update 2 are different enough that they deserve their own separate videos. Let me know what you thought of this video in the comments, and suggest what I should cover next on my Twitter. You should also follow me there, because that's when I'm announcing when I'll be streaming at twitch.tv forward slash See you all next time. Thank you to the patrons for supporting the channel.